It's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to our NIH grant writing workshop on behalf of the WVCTSI. Uh, I need to thank Sarah Heyman and Jody Saunders for their assistance in, in making sure everything's running smoothly. And my colleague, Rob Milner, who you'll hear from in just a moment from the Keck School of Medicine. If we go to the next slide, uh, well, you'll see is yesterday, we tried to set the stage for those of you who were able to join us to talk about how NIH works, how grants are reviewed, things you need to think about when you're preparing your application so it's successful. This morning, our focus is going to be on career development awards, specifically mentored career development awards called K Awards. And we're going to first do an overview of the case. And then the second hour will be focused on a unique award for postdocs or residents that need some postdoctoral training and transition to an independent award, what we call the Kangaroo Award. So it's my pleasure to welcome our uh, speaker, Rob Milner. And Rob, do you want to take it from here? Rob yes. is very distinguished and we're so glad he's with us. So thanks, Rob. Thanks, thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome everybody. And particularly welcome back if you joined us yesterday and are returning for a second session. As John said, today we're gonna to focus on career development awards, K awards, both general and then more specifically the K99 R00 uh, later in the session. And our goal in this workshop is to provide guidance on applications for care awards, NIH Career Development Awards. And what you need to do is to think about the appropriate type of award for your particular career stage and situation. As you'll, you'll learn, there's a, a variety of these for different populations of scientists. And to complete an award, um, hopefully successfully, we will guide you through the application, um, letting you know what goes where. And that's essentially the, the outline of the session today. I'm going to introduce the awards, tell you a little bit about each one, talk about success rates and those uh, kinds of things. And then Dr. Lukoski will take you over and do anatomy of an application, really dissecting uh, what you need to put where in your application in order to be successful. And along the way, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Zoom chat box um, and we'll pause at intervals to try and address those. We may not get through all of those. Um, and we may have time at the end of both of these sessions uh, to go back and look at your questions. So as we said yesterday, NIH provides a series of awards that provide support for career development at different stages as you move along the kind of pipeline from student to postdoc and resident to junior faculty and senior faculty. Uh, we start off with uh, the fellowship awards that we're going to talk about in session next Thursday. But what we're going to focus on today are the K awards, the career development awards. And the goal of all of these awards is to get you to a point where you're competitive for the gold standard research project award. Uh, from NIH, the R01, that get you to be an independent um, research investigator. The current budget at NIH has about slightly less, $852 million, or slightly less than 2% of the total NIH budget that supports these kinds of award mechanisms, roughly 4,500 trainees. And there are a wide variety of different types, um, all with the K number from K01 to K99. These vary from time to time. Some are phased out, some are brought in, new ones. And they cover the spectrum of different populations of researchers, the for clinicians, basic scientists, for junior and for senior faculty. This morning, we're going to focus on the Mentored K Awards that are designed specifically for postdocs and junior faculty. And those are the K01, K08, K23, and K99 R00. And the goal of all of these is to give you support and that protected time over a period of, of time, three to five years, 
for you to get an intensive supervised career development experience in an area of biomedical research that says that, that leads, as I said earlier, to research independence, to competitive, to be competitive for an R01. And these are mentored awards and a dedicated experience mentor is essential, not only for the application, but even once you've been successful in getting funding to guide you through a successful outcome and to the next stage of your career. And it shouldn't just be a single mentor. Candidates are really encouraged to put together a mentoring team. Just like for those of you who did um, doctoral thesis, you had a thesis committee and you selected members of that committee based on their expertise. So one of the early things in thinking about one of these awards is who's gonna be on your mentoring team? You'll have a primary mentor with whom you'll work most closely, probably work in, in his or her lab. Um, they will provide support for your research, but then they will be complemented by a series of co-mentors selected to address all of the different aspects of your award. So when you look at your proposal and see the different features, the different approaches you're using, make sure you have somebody experienced on your mentoring a team to address each of those. In particular, if you're using biostatistics, please make sure you have a biostatistician on your mentoring team. Do not use somebody as a consultant. They should be integral to your mentoring team and use them to complement the expertise of you and your primary mentor. And that's really a very early decision. Once you've thought about what the scope is going to be, what the kind of research, think about who you're going to enlist and start working with them. Now, the kinds of awards that we're going to talk about this morning um, really span that part of your career that goes from postdoc to resident through junior faculty to becoming an independent investigator. And these are the awards that we're going to discuss. The KOA, the Mentored Clinical Scientist Award, the K23, also for clinicians, but dedicated to patient-oriented research. K01, the Mentored Research Scientist Award, which is the major uh, K award um, directed at basic scientists, non-clinicians. There's an older award called the K22, a Career Trans Transition Award that we'll talk about briefly, but that's largely been supplanted by the Pathway to Independence Award or the K99R0, which as you can see, really spans that scope, that spectrum from postdoc to becoming an independent investigator. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the characteristics of each of these awards. So the K01, the Mentored Research Scientist Award, as I said, is the major award that's available for non-clinicians. Obviously, and it's designed to develop research independence or to foster career development in a new area. And it's for all of these awards, the candidates have to have potential to become a productive independent researcher. And you require a mentor who has extensive both research experience and mentoring experience. Typically, a typical of all of these awards is that you must devote at least 75% effort over three to five years. You can, for these kinds of awards, where as a basic scientist, you may not have other duties, no clinical activities, no teaching uh, responsibilities, you can fully devote 100% of your time but the minimum is 75%. Now I will warn you that this award mechanism is used differently by different NIH institutes. Most of them support the K01, but they may use it for different purposes. They may direct it towards different areas of science. They may direct it towards particular populations of applicants. It's important to do your research look on the websites, as we told you yesterday, and contact the program officer at the institute that is most likely to support your research and ask him or her you know, those questions. Does what I'm proposing fall within the scope of, of your institute? Am I eligible for this award? Is this something you're going to be enthusiastic about supporting? The KOA is to develop clinical research scientists. 
It requires a clinical doctoral degree. You must have initiated postgraduate training and you can be a resident, but not necessarily completed all of your uh, fellowship and subspecialty training. Like the KO1, a mentor with extensive research experience, and again, 75% effort over three to five years. That effort is often a challenge for clinicians. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great advantage for you as a clinician scientist to have that protected time promised by your department chair. But it comes with um, obviously financial and other kinds of, of implications. And it's very tough for some specialties to be able to devote that. And NIH is willing to down negotiate that to a minimum of 50% for individuals who are in procedural disciplines, surgical disciplines, understanding that they need a significant portion of their time to maintain uh, their clinical uh, activities. The K23 is really very similar to the KOA. The major difference is that the focus of the research has to be for patient-oriented research. A KOA can be for physician scientists who are working in lab and basic science projects, but the K23 has to involve patients, direct um, human research. Uh, you have a clinical or nursing doctoral degree, any kind of terminal degree, but for this one, you must have completed all clinical training because the focus is on patients. You must be completed all of your training uh, to, to treat, train, to treat uh, patients. So you must have completed all your residency, fellowship, any subspecialty fellowship training. Again, meant with extensive research experience, 75% effort, three to five years. Again, a challenge for that. The K99R00, the Pathway to Independence Award, is specifically designed to facilitate independent funding earlier in an investigator's career. And we'll talk more about this in the second hour and the reasons why this um, particular award came into being about 15 years ago. It's directed specifically at postdoctoral scientists and it's established, as, we, as we'll show you, uh, later in the sessions in response to data that showed that individuals were receiving their first independent support at an ever increasing age. The really attractive part of this award is it's the only K award for which non-US citizens are eligible. You simply need to have a visa um, enabling you to work in the United States in order to be eligible for this award. So it's a really attractive award and it's really combined because it combines elements of both a K award, the K99 and an R series award, hence the R00. And comes as we'll show you in the second hour in two phases, a K99 phase, one to two years of mentored support as a postdoc, and then transitioning to the R00 phase, where you can get up to three years of support contingent on being in an independent research position, such as a tenure track uh, assistant professor uh, faculty appointment. But we'll talk much more about that uh, in, the next, uh, in the second hour. An award that's older has been around for a long time as the K22 and really had the same uh, goals as the K99R00. It transitioned its support for postdocs to transition into faculty positions. It's largely been phased out, but it's still supported by a handful of NIH institutes that again, like the K01, use the award in somewhat different ways. Some may, uh, for example, uh, require training for the initial phase in intramural NIH programs, and then going on to a faculty position outside the NIH. So those are the major career, uh, mentored career development awards. There's also a number of other kinds of, of awards that are, are less prominent, less highly used, uh, KO2, KO7. One I'll point out particularly is the K24, and this is given to mid-career investigators. People are about 15 years into their career around associate professor. 
And it's designed to provide those individuals with support so that they can mentor younger junior faculty on K-23 awards. So if you look, if you're thinking of submitting a K-23 and you're looking for mentors uh, for that award, for your proposal, take a look at your institution and see if there are any faculty there that have a K-24 because they are paid by NIH to be mentors on K-23s. Uh, and they are, because they go through the scrutiny of peer review and gaining the award, excellent mentors and very well qualified. And then there's a number of others. It's worth you know, thinking about if you're in a particular niche area, um, for example, quantitative research, that's designed either for quantitative research to gain experience in biomedical sciences or biomedical sciences to gain experience in quantitative research. So think about some of those niche awards. These are not supported by all NIH institutes. The ones we're talking about focusing on today largely are. Here are some of the common features as you've seen from the description so far. You have to have a terminal doctoral degree of some sort, PhD, MD, uh, DNP. Um, for most of the awards, except for the K99R00, you must be a US citizen, a non-citizen national, or a permanent resident. And you're not eligible if you have been a pre PI principal investigator previously on an R or a K grant, largely because if you've already held an R grant, you've already met the goal of the K. You, you don't need a K if you already got to that point. And if you already had a K award, what did you do with it? And why do you need another one? Duration, typically three to five years. And as I said, minimum effort 75, you can ask for up to 100. And if you're a clinician in a procedural discipline, that can be down negotiated to 50%. But all of these require a substantial investment of protected time, both for you and for your department. The good news is that these award mechanisms have high success rates. And success rate is very simply uh, the number in any one fiscal year, the number of awards that get funded divided by the number that um, were submitted. So as you can see, the, well, hopefully the letters got really small. Um, the K01, K08, and K23 have success rates in the 30 to 40% range. So around a one in three or less chance of success. And this shows in 2020, the number of awards of each type, the number of new awards that were awarded around the 200s. The K99 is a little bit more competitive. It's been around 25% for, for many years. Uh, so one in four for the K99R00 and just shy of 100 were awarded last year. The K22 is less competitive, hovering a little above 20%. But as I said, this has largely been phased out and only 40 awards were given uh, last year. These are excellent success rates in comparison to your colleagues who are further ahead in, the re in their research and are applying for R01s from NIH. The success rate for a new R01 at NIH in 2020 was 19.1%. Again, about one in five. So you're gonna have better chances uh, with the case and with an R01. And always doing your preparation, having good mentors, being in a great institution, having great science will enhance your odds way above what's shown in, in this diagram. The other thing to know is that, not a, that the success rates for these awards very widely across different institutions, as well as the number of awards um, funded by each institution. So you can see on this diagram for K99s from 2018, where the average NIH success rate for the K99 was 26%. 
there were institutes that had success rates above and below uh, that average fairly substantially. So if your research fits into more than one, the scope of more than one NIH institute, you know, be an educated consumer and see, well, where do I have the better chance? Um, think about that aspect as you um, select the institute that potentially will fund your application. And this diagram, this matrix, which shows uh, the NIH institutes on the vertical axis and the different award mechanisms across the horizontal axis. And these check marks show you which awards are supported by which institute, illustrates that not all institutes support all K awards. Almost all support the K08, the K23, the K99, R00. Many support the K01, but in different ways. Many fewer support the K22. The NIH website has an incredible um, variety of information, essential information for both career development and training. You go to this website. And by the way, when we send out the PDFs for uh, the slides, uh, anything, any, all the links that are in blue in the boxes at the bottom of the slide will be hot links. So you can go directly to that, to that page. If you go to this page, the training page at NIH, click on this button, the career development kiosk, it will take you to descriptions of each of the awards. So you can see listed down here, the different award types, click on these, and it will take you to a more descriptive page about each award. And that will include all the funding opportunity announcements, the program announcements that fall under that award mechanism. And there'll be a wide variety of those, both the parent awards that we talked about last year, last yesterday, the generic applications, as well as specific funding opportunity announcements that direct you to either a specific area of research or a specific population of applicants. When you go to the program announcement for your award mechanism, click on this link, I see specific scientific interests and contacts, and it will take you to a page that will provide you with both contact information for the program offices at each institution, at each institute that supports the award mechanism, and often specific information about you know, how much salary or how much research expenses does that institute provide uh, with that particular award mechanism. As we talked about yesterday, these award mechanisms are reviewed by five criteria. The candidate, your potential uh, to be a productive independent scientist, the career development plan and goals and objectives that you and your mentors have assembled. The research plan, what you're going to be doing as in terms of the experimental approach. Your mentors, as well as consultants and collaborators, but particularly the mentors. You know, what are their characteristics and, and what is their experience in, in training? And the environment and institutional commitment to the candidate and that's where that commitment of protected time is demonstrated by a letter from your department chair. What's really important is to understand these uh, review criteria. To be successful, you need scores of ones and twos in each of these five categories. And as I turn it over to Dr. Lukoski, she will take you through the application and illustrate where in the application you need to direct your attention and address the, um, the review criteria for each of these uh, five areas. So it's really critical you think about these and you write your proposal directed at these criteria. I'm gonna stop there. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat so far. And Ralph, if you unmute your screen, I'll switch to my screen. Yeah. Great. I it's I don't see anything in the chat. Um, Rob, one thing I was going to mention about the K ninety nine awards, and uh, hopefully, can you see my screen? I can. No. Okay. Let me try that again. No, I can. I can see your screen. It's fine. Oh. Okay. Great. It says an enemy. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. One of the things I want to mention. 
the K99s are now up to about 300 per year. Mm -hmm. And when you and I first started uh, doing this program with Dr. Sirhuni at the National Postdoc Association uh, 15 years ago, they only funded less than 200. And it was uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who's the immediate past director of NIH, whose goal is to get that number up to 400. So even though the K99 looks competitive, they're actually funding more of these awards. And so that's really a, a good sign. Okay. Okay, so you can all see my anatomy of an application. Is that correct? Yes? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, if there aren't any questions, we'll stop again, hopefully at the end, and uh, try to address your questions. So uh, as we learned yesterday, be sure that you obtain the most recent version of the program announcement. And the reason is it has all the information you need. And as we discussed, there is a parent announcement and that's for the unsolicited applications three times a year. And when you click on the program announcement, be careful that you look for the version that you need. If you're not doing a clinical trial, if you are doing a clinical trial, or independent basic experimental studies with humans required. So this is, there are three versions of each uh, parent award. So please pay attention to that. Also, when you look at these program announcements, notice this illustration says PA 20 dash 190. Um, the 190, the 176, the 191, those numbers will stay the same, but over time, the middle numbers tell you what fiscal year this award notice was changed. So when you go in to make sure you have the most current one, there might be a 2021 or a 2022. So that's where you have to be constantly checking with NIH to see if things have been updated. Again, there are program announcements for each of the K awards. Again, um, the K01 for independent trial, not allowed is gonna be the one for those of you who are doing PhDs and basic studies at the bench. The K08 and K22, K23, uh, again, make sure you look for the announcement that speaks to what type of subject matter you're using. And that's true for the K99. And again, these links will help you get to the right detail at the NIH website, and that gets updated. So a key thing about a K application, this is an application, even though you are the principal investigator the PI, this is still a collaboration between you and your mentor, you and your supervisor if you're a postdoc, or you and your mentoring team. So remember, as the principal investigator, you're responsible for the application. You can't, uh, you have to take full responsibility to make sure everything's submitted on time meets all the institutional guidelines. No, your mentors will help. But make sure you write your research training plan, do the first draft, but then it really becomes a collaboration with your sponsor or your mentor. And again, your mentor or mentors actually have to write sections of the application. They actually get a score. So make sure when you're thinking of doing a K award, you discuss this with your, your mentors early on, and then make sure you get them involved in the process. Don't just wait before two weeks before this application is due to be submitted to get them involved. You're going to need your mentors for crafting a competitive application you're also going to need them when the award you receive the award for your K. 
Now, what does it mean to be a PI, a principal investigator? Well, on the SF-424 form on page two, there's a little box, very innocuous. But it also says that you're, you're aware that any false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements or claims may subject me to criminal, civil, or administrative penalty. Uh, by clicking this box, and your institution will do this on your behalf, you're making that professional commitment to be honest and uh, use the funds wisely and do your best to make sure the application you have submitted is true, complete, and accurate. Um, and you know, these boxes are all too easy to check. We, we do this all the time when we have to use a new app or we're to connecting up to a, a new Wi-Fi. But just remember, this is your signature. This is your professional commitment and take it seriously because even though you're in an early stage in your career, you're through your, your coming years, you're going to be applying for research funding or submitting proposals. If you're in the industry, you always have to bring your full attention to conducting your research in the most ethical manner possible. Now, K's have moving parts and I'm gonna go through them and Try not to get you too worried, but for those of you who've maybe had the experience of submitting a K award, it's one of the diff most difficult awards that NIH has because there's so many pieces. However, you will have between four to six pages to provide the information that describes you as a candidate, and we'll talk about that and then approximately six to eight pages for your research plan. So it's a short research plan. Now, in total combined, these pages are 12, and it's up to you to decide how many pages are gonna go into the candidate section, how many into the research strategy. I would recommend typically a minimum of five pages for a really in-depth, thorough candidate information plan. And then that leaves you about seven pages for your research, plus one for specific aims pages. So keep this in mind as you start putting this application together, there are space limitations. And as uh, Rob has indicated today, you always have to be thinking of writing to the criteria. Why do we write to the criteria? That's because the scientists and clinicians reviewing your application are instructed to comment on the criteria. So to get a one as a candidate or one or a two, the parts of the application that will inform the reviewers uh, decision includes your bio sketch, includes what you write up in the career development plan, how you talk about your training goals, your overall career objectives, and your experiences that you plan. Likewise, related to that and interwined with the fit for you is the training potential. And this is the unique feature of a K award. Without getting a good score in your training potential plan, you're not going to get funded. Now, the research training plan is very similar to any research plan. However, the caveat is that there's something new you're going to be learning. So even if you've worked in someone's lab for a couple years, say you've been a postdoc there for three years, and you wanna move on to the next K, you have to propose something that's new and different. And that's why it's not just a research plan, but a research training plan. The mentors yeah. get to write and we'll share more about that. And then you also have to score well on the environment. I wanted to now, mention there's a question in the chat box. Okay, well, let's come to that in a minute. Okay, okay, thanks, Sarah. 
one of the important parts about this, as you think about your, your application, a K award is about you as the applicant. So this is the one time your grant is not about we or your mentors, it's your story. So you're the applicant with great promise. Uh, you have proposed a training plan, a career development plan that's going to give you new skills. By conducting the research, you're going to receive more training and get preliminary data and publications that you need for your R01. You've got the right mentors and your institution is behind you. All five of these factors have to come together to achieve your goal. Rob, um, do you want to take the question in the chat? I, I answered it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay. And uh, you're, I can still hear you, so just we're good. So let's go on to you as the candidate. The first place reviewers are going to meet you is, is at your NIH biosketch. So pay attention to the professional look, the accuracy, and the information. Now, um, there's been a slight change where there's no longer section D, that information goes up under the personal statement, but you can go to the NIH website and find the most current form. And literally you're gonna have a brief paragraph to describe why, why you are well-suited. You'll have an opportunity to talk about your positions, if you've maybe received a pilot grant or you've uh, won a, an award at a national meeting, be sure to highlight those things. And then you'll briefly describe your contributions to science, which are what you've conducted in your publications. And you can have a URL to uplink your, your reader to your bibliography. In most cases, the reviewers won't have time to go look at this, but occasionally uh, a reviewer might want to read one of your papers. Now, you as a candidate are supported by your letters of reference. The folks that write reference letters know you well, hopefully understand that you're applying for this K award because you've asked them to write the letter and their letters serve as the, the piece of information about your readiness for this award. And their letters need to address your skill to your competency and your long-term potential for a career in biomedical research as an independent investigator. And unique to the case, you need a cover letter where the name, department, and institution of the referees are listed. And there's lots of information for you, and we, can, we touched on that a little bit yesterday. Now we're transitioning into the next part of the application, the Career Development Training Award Plan. But this also informs the committee about you and you're here on this side of the bridge and it will inform them about where you want to be when you finally achieve independence. So this is a really important thing to think about. You need this K award <clears throat> to get from A to B and all the activities you're planning will help you achieve that. So what is this really? This is really your past history up until the time you submit the application. You will have one page to really communicate that information. And then you're going to have some information about your future career. And that's what we call the section on setting your goals. So you're going to want to explain to the reviewers, where do you want to be when in your future career and what are the specific objectives of your current K? And then almost maybe three and a half pages will be telling your reviewers, here's my plan. 
Here are the mentors who are going to help me, why I've selected them, how frequently I'm going to meet with them. Here are my objectives for what I need to learn. And here are the training activities and didactic courses, conferences, working visits to laboratories that comprise my plan. So this is really the critical piece of a K application because if the reviewers think you have a really clear plan of who you are, what you need to learn and where you want to go and how you're gonna get there, you're going to have a very successful K. So the candidate information section has a, a one page for you to describe your background and experience and what you've published. Uh, it's difficult to fit all this information and you want it to be an interesting story too, where the reviewers can quickly understand where you've been, but why, even though you've published a lot, you still need more training. You can kind of keep the training goals and objectives well organized, maybe half a page, but then the bulk of the information is the training activities, your mentors who are gonna help you gain these new skills and the new activities that you plan. And it's really important, especially if you've been in the same laboratory for a number of years already and you're asking for another two or three or four years to stay in the same laboratory, what is it that you're going to learn that's new? And we highly recommend that you include a timeline, a, a, even a figure that summarizes this so that your reviewer can instantly see that you've planned out your activities for year one, year two, year three, year four. And remember, you have to describe your goals. Now, we're not trained in describing our goals, but what you have to do is, is get them enthusiastic that you have a vision for what area of science, what area of clinical practice you want to become a leader, an independent investigator. And then you're going to give them some very specific goals for this specific K award, the objectives, and don't just make it focused on technical skills. Be sure you include a goal that will give you the advanced professional skills so that you're equipped to manage your own program. Management skills, mentoring skills, um, anything that will help you to learn how to write a grant even. And then again, you will get to describe how and why your institutional environment is going to help you. Again, there are lots of ways to make timelines. This is, but you can see this one is just one, two, three, four, five each of the years. But again, you even need to include some milestones of what you will accomplish each year. Now, your mentor also has to do some detailed information, but you will sort of describe how and why you selected these individuals. You don't have a lot of space. Their bio sketches go in the application, but be very specific that you're going to meet with your primary mentor at least weekly. If you have a couple co-mentors, how you're going to meet with them, and then bring those team of mentors together, maybe every month or every two months. And then you may have an advisory committee. Maybe you have a biostatistician on it. Maybe you have an expert in your clinical specialty. And then bring this advisory committee to the table uh, with your mentors, maybe every six months but you have to have a detailed plan for mentoring. And interestingly, it has to match what your mentors write about you. You can include other individuals and those could be collaborators, consultants, 
by an, an advisory committee, but just keep in mind there's a six page limit for these letters of support. And these individuals cannot be the folks writing your letters of reference. Now, the research plan is fundamental to this application, but the research plan has to fit with your goals. So at the mock study section we saw yesterday, we had an applicant who was a clinician who wanted to sort of switch from bench work to doing uh, community engagement research, very different skill sets. And he had the wrong mentor. He had a mentor who knew how to do things at the bench, but he wanted to learn something new. So this is where you need to make things match. Again, your research plan should include a hypothesis, aims to test this, the methods, the techniques, and discussions of outcomes and problems and how you might uh, solve those problems. Now, this plan should be tailored to you and your experience and make sure you get feedback from this application from your mentors and colleagues because it still should be good science. And that's what we do to strengthen our science. Your research plan uh, will have approximately six to eight pages, typically eight. Organize it by sections. What's the significance, innovation, and approach? And again, at the end of your research plan, you might have a timeline. Don't forget, you will have to include information on responsible conduct of research instruction. You're limited to one page, and it's very formatted. You have to comment on items one through five. And I guarantee most of your institutions, including our own, have uh, examples of this information. And this is a requirement. Now, turning to the career award mentor statements, your mentors and co-mentors have to complete six pages. So if you have one mentor, he or she does six pages. Say you have three mentors, maybe your primary mentor will do four, and each of the co-mentors will do one, one page for a total of six. They have to describe the plans for your career development, uh, the support they have available during for your project, how they're going to supervise you, how many other individuals they're supervising, their experience as being a mentor, but most of all, a plan for your transition to be an independent investigator. NIH doesn't want you to grow up to be a clone of your mentor, because then the two of you will be competing for the same funding. They want you to branch out and be complementary to your mentor. In fact, they want you to be the next generation that's using new creative approaches. So your mentors have to have a strong record. Uh, typically, if they're a full professor, they've been mentoring folks for many years. If you happen to have a mentor who's an assistant professor, absolutely, if they haven't received tenure, include a co-mentor who has that. And you can always add an advisory team to strengthen any areas where the expertise of your mentors is not covered. And as was mentioned earlier today, perhaps that's where you might put your biostatistician. And last of all, you need to describe the institutional environment. What are the resources that are there for you? And what kind of intellectual stimulation will you have? What journal clubs you'll go to, what seminars you go to. If you're using resources like the WVCTSI or a CTSA at your institution, those can be very important resources. You have one page that you need to describe. It's not as boilerplate as writing a facility statement. This is still a story about you, how your, these resources attracted you to your institution, and they are available 
and it's going to help you achieve your goal. You will also need a one page of an institutional commitment, and this must go on letterhead. This is the official statement that the institution will provide you the percent effort of protected time you've requested. So if you've requested 100% protected time, that should be in writing. If it's 75% or it's 50%, that should be there. And any specific details that can go into this letter about the commitment to you should be in this letter. Now, for folks doing a K99 R00, as we'll talk about later, this is a commitment to you during the K99 award. And so keep that in mind. It's not a job offer for you for a position in your R00 phase. But what's also very good about this kind of letter, it's for the way for the institution to show how you're receiving this training will advance the institution's ability to meet its mission and goals with respect to research. So again, typically a dean might write this, some cases a department chair, but it has to be someone who has the official capacity to guarantee that. So as I mentioned at the beginning, lots of moving parts. You're going to have to coordinate not only what you write, but getting the mentors to get their six pages together, coordinating the six page, up to six pages for letters of support from your collaborators, making sure you have that one page institutional commitment. And most likely your mentor will help you with this uh, because it has to go to a senior official. And don't forget the reference letters. They need to be in on time. So again, for a K award, you have to plan ahead. This is not the kind of grant application you can write two weeks before the submission deadline. Now, remember yesterday we discussed this, you're going to be developing the application, but there are all these other parts, what we call the front parts. You're gonna to have to make sure there's a cover letter, a 30 line abstract, a three sentence narrative, your bibliography, and all these other pieces. Who can help you with this will be the individuals in your department or your respective grants office or your office of sponsored programs at your institution. Really work with these folks in advance. They know how to fill out these forms so you don't lose sleep of knowing what goes in what place for the application. And trust me, these folks are the folks that make a difference with every grant submission. So you'll need to come up with a title and your cover letter will get submitted. These are important and again, Keep in mind the title can be searched by the Freedom of Information Act. It also gets screened by the Center for Scientific Review. So make sure you have keywords relevant to your application. Budgets for Ks are very standard. So this literally you want to first talk with your program officer from your institute and then consult with your grant office. And it's very simple. So this is the good news. This is the easy piece. You'll have to write that project summary. Do it last because it's like an abstract for a manuscript. This will show up on the NIH website when your grant is awarded. So make sure it's clear and accurate. You'll need your bibliography, facilities, equipment. This is a place where if you're using some specialized equipment, the details can go in. But absolutely, write to the review criteria under each of these five boxes. This is the way you can get your K funded even on a first submission. Now, importantly, there are three submission cycles with NIH, and so three deadlines per year. 
The one in February is February 12th. In June, which is our next one, is June 12th, October 12th. And the applications then received, and I'll click on February 12th, will be reviewed most likely late June, early July. You'll get your score, and a few weeks later, you'll get your summary statement. If you have a, a score and your program officer wants to have it walk to council, the funding decision will happen in September, October. And keep in mind, sometimes these Ks get delayed because of the NIH budget, which is a federal budget, which starts October 1st. But the earliest you could start with a February submission would be December. But oftentimes, and I've had this with a KO1 in my group, the funding didn't start till the following July. So things with NIH are not always as quick as you would hope. So if we think about this, when you write your K, always plan for two submissions. And what I mean by that is say you submitted this February, it was reviewed in June, but you got a score back and it was uh, maybe a four or five and you had good comments on what needed to be fixed. You would then plan on a resubmission and you actually, instead of submitting on October 12th, you get an extra month because you're already in the system. So that resubmission would go in November and you go through the whole process. And again, if you had a good score, instead of being funded in nine or 10 months, it would take up to 18 months. So we really recommend plan ahead on your calendar to be able to do two submissions. Because as we said yesterday, getting funded requires persistence, okay? With that, Rob, let's open up to questions. We can take a few before we go on to the K99 awards. And if there are any in the chat room, uh, let's take a look, or if someone wants to uh, speak up or raise their hand, we will do our best to address your question. Uh, the only one was about whether the specific aims page was included in the 12 page total, but it, okay. I responded to that in the chat. It's, it's in addition. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a one page separate from the 12 pages. And, and, and we'll talk a lot more about specific aims uh, next, this time next week. Right on Friday next week. In fact, that will be an interactive session where you can start developing your own draft of your specific aims. Um, one comment I wanted to make is the issue of eligibility. We can advise you on the eligibility criteria, but particularly if you're applying for a specialized diversity award, uh, there's some in neuroscience for a brain initiative that is targeted um, more for women in science. Uh, there's some diversity awards that are very much targeted for underrepresented minorities. But as CTRs, many of us are focused on rural health issues. We can advise you what we think would be whether or not you're eligible. But in truth, it's always the funder who makes the decision. And keep in mind with the K awards, uh, there have been some extensions in eligibility relevant to the K99 award, and we'll touch upon that in the next session. Okay, Rob, uh, thank you for this session. Okay. Mm -hmm. And everyone, thank you for your attention. We're going to uh, switch things now and move on to our K99. And there hopefully- a few, a few questions just popped up in the chat box. So I didn't okay. want to get missed. Um, what, what are the key specific elements of a diversity award? Um, literally the, the award will tell you if you have to provide any additional statements. But typically, um, it's exactly the same. There might be 
um, an additional statement that you have to add about why you're qualified for an award. But um, basically, the candidate will be judged by the committee, the reviewers, to see if they meet the criteria listed in the proposal. Yeah, there is an extra statement that's required for those those awards. It's but like item 12 or something in the... Mm -hmm. Yep. But and it, if you look at the instructions, if you look through the instructions for the K mm -hmm. awards, you'll see that highlighted. Okay. Any other... Thing? Questions, There's Sarah? one other. Yes, sure. it says, if in a resubmission cycle, how does one respond to drastically different comments between reviewers? So for example, two reviewers say the career development plan is excellent and one says it is underdeveloped. Well, responding to a resubmission is an art form and not a science because you have three people, they may all agree on what's a weakness or they may have one person who's concerned about a specific area. You will have the opportunity in a resubmission to add a one page introduction. And my suggestion is to pay attention when you receive the summary statement to all the things the reviewers liked about your application. So you keep those, but then address the concerns. And so even if one reviewer has a concern that the others haven't had, you have to make sure maybe you, you address that in that introduction one page. And again, when you do a resubmission, that one page introduction page almost becomes as important as your specific aims because they're going to want to see, did you listen to the reviewer's comments? Nothing gets a review panel more upset than saying, you know, I disagreed with the reviewers. They didn't know what they were doing. They must have been asleep. Never, never, never offend your reviewers because the reviewers are your advocate. They're the folks that are there to explain to the rest of the research community why your grant should be funded. So work with your mentor and make a draft. You can run that draft maybe by your program officer and get some feedback. Um, and it, it, it takes time to sort out how you're gonna respond. Um, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes they say, well, you know, it would be helpful if we had a little data or this candidate has a weakness in their publication record. Well, you fix those things. If you have a weakness in your publication record, you make sure your training plan describes how you're going to get training in manuscript writing, and your training plan shows how you're going to be publishing each year through your KO work. So don't ignore a, a weakness from a reviewer, but at the same time, don't get discouraged. Okay, your reviewers many times are pointing out the areas that if you address a concern, you're ultimately gonna have a more successful application. So mentally, I know it's hard when we get criticism, thank the reviewers for what they've done because they care about science and they care about you being part of the biomedical workforce. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would just, actually, I have a one word response to that, which is polite. <laughs> how do you respond? Politely. <laughs> and well I, I, it's, it's worth looking at the details. You know, why did the second reviewer say yeah. it was underdeveloped? And you can say something like reviewer one praise. Uh, the, in contrast, reviewer two had concerns and addressed those. And here's my toolkit for the summary statement. I take a really nice highlighter that's green and I highlight everything they say that's really terrific because they'll say great things. Like they might give you one as a candidate, but then I take a color and I'm not a fan of pink or you can use an orange highlighter and highlight what is a weakness and then make a list of the weaknesses and come up with a plan with your mentor how are you going to address that weakness? Don't change your application until you kind of sort out, here are the concerns, 
and here's how I'm going to address them in the application. So it's very strategic thinking, but Rob, you're absolutely right. Politeness is a requirement. Oh. Uh, there's a second question. Can you still be funded if the Career Development Award will actually serve another country? For example, being interested in issues that have more concerns to other countries. I, I would suggest that's a good topic to discuss with the program officer, right. because that's really about the scope and direction. And they may be able to advise you, they may be able to advise you of specific programs or institutes that mm -hmm. deal with global health. Or it may be able to, it may be possible to relate the question mm -hmm. that you're studying in the context of that co country back to health issues in the United States. So Right. Yeah. And there, there is the Institute, the Fogarty International Center. I don't know if they're funding K's right now, but they do fund different kinds of research awards for international research. But absolutely. A good program officer, even if you're doing studying a phenomena that's overseas, you may want to get some guidance on how to relate it back to policy and practice in biomedical research or healthcare delivery in the United States. So don't get discouraged. Just keep asking good questions. Okay, but let's 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 move on to the second session where we're going to focus on the Pathway to Independence, the K99R00 Award. And as with our previous session, our goal is to give you guidance on this specific award mechanism. And your objectives are to describe those requirements, the criteria, and to complete an application. And as the last session, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this particular award. And then Dr. Lakowski will take you through the anatomy, essentially the the award, the proposal is very similar to the ones we described. The criteria are the same, but there are additional questions that you need to address that are specific to this particular award mechanism. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the Zoom chat box. So we talked about the career timeline. We talked about the K awards. We talked about the goal of getting them, getting you to research independence. But over time, what NIH has observed was that the age at which individuals were getting to that point of research independence was steadily increasing. And these are now, you know, 20 year old data, but you can see this trend from 1980 through to the early 2000s, really so that it was by, you know, kind of early mid forties that people were getting that first R01. And this clearly is not, not a good way of promoting and maintaining, sustaining a research um, in enterprise. And so various steps were put in place by one of the previous NIH directors, Elias Sahuni. And one of those was the K99R00 Pathway to Independence Award, which has the specific goal of lowering that age at which you would receive your first R01. It's for highly promising postdocs, specifically directed at that, and it was established in response to those data. And as we said previously, non-citizens and US citizens alike are equally eligible. And I don't know the current data, but it certainly is in the really roughly split between those two categories. And the purpose of the award is to facilitate that transition from postdoc to meant from, from a mentored postdoc into an independent tenure track or equivalent faculty position. And that really is, it's, it's catalyzing that transition. And so it combines aspects of both a career development award, hence the K99, and an R01, hence the R00. And as we said, it comes in two phases, up to five years total support, and you apply for the total five years with a single application. Your proposal outlines what you're gonna do in each of the two phases. And the K99 phase is for postdocs, 
providing one to two years of mentored support as a postdoc, leading to transition to the R00 phase, which is up to three years of support. And that is largely contingent on you securing an independent research position, typically a assistant professor tenure track position at a research uh, institution. And the decision, as I said, you apply for a single award, so it, you describe both phases in your application, the transition, the approval to, trans, to move from the K99 to the R00 phase is determined by program staff. It does not have to go through a re-review and it's dependent on you meeting certain criteria, completing the goals for the K99 phase and securing a position for the R00 phase. You do not have to do those two phases at different institutions. You can do them at the same institution. When it was first um, established, people felt, well, we have to move, but no, you can stay at the same institution as long as you can make the argument that that institution is going to support your research. These awards have very strict eligibility criteria. You can only apply for a K99R00 when you're within four years of completing uh, your doctoral degree or residency training, i.e. no more than four years postdoctoral research training. Because of COVID, there is a two, currently a two cycle, eight month extension on top of the, that, four year, um, uh, that four year time limit. And be aware that that timing, you know, exactly when you got your degree that counts that four year clock may depend, different institutes may count that differently. They may count it as the date on your thesis. They may count it as the date you received your, your degree. And so again, talk to program officers and look in detail to make sure that you stay within that cycle. And we'll talk about when in that four year time period is the best place to start thinking, best time to start thinking about submitting one of these awards. You also need to be non-independent, i.e. you cannot have held an independent research position, you cannot have been assistant professor, had a, a faculty title, or have been a PI on NIH research or career development awards. You're not yet independent requires commitment of 75%, minimum of 75%, and US citizens and non-citizens are equally eligible. You simply have to have approval, appropriate visa to work in the United States. The K99 phase, as I said, provides one to two years of mentored support. Um, you can do it with a clinical, any kind of doctorate. You have to have a terminal degree. The training may be at NIH, or extramural anywhere in the United States, but not at foreign institutions. Total cost per year, maybe it varies by different institutes and, and centers, includes salary and some uh, research support. But check that when you go to this link, um, you'll see for that de described for each of the institutes at NIH that supports uh, this award. The R00 phase, is to support you as an independent scientist in a tenure track or equivalent full-time uh, first faculty position, which is an assistant professor. You cannot do this at a federal or foreign institution, so you can't do it at NIH, you can't do it outside the United States. And as I said, the transition between the, the two phases is determined by program staff at NIH, and it's based on reviewing your progress, completing goals for the K99 phase, and that commitment of a position where you can conduct the R00 phase. And that new institution must demonstrate that commitment to you. They must met, uh, demonstrate commitment to the 75% effort, a bribe, provide you with appropriate space, and all of those good things. It's important to know that they cannot reduce support that they would normally give somebody in that kind of position because you bump, you, you're coming in with an R00 award. 
So they can't say, oh, we're going to give you less startup because you already have an R00. They are expected to treat you exactly the same as any other starting assistant professor on the tenure track, you know, with the appropriate startup, uh, institutional support, and, and so on. That phase comes with up to 249,000 total costs in NIH funding per year. And I wanna emphasize that that's total costs, that 250K, 249K. So with an NIH award, NIH provides the investigator with direct costs. That's the money that you're given for salary, research expenses, and, and so on. In addition, NIH provides your institution with what are called indirect costs at a certain percentage, usually maybe around 70%, something like that, 65%. So for every $100,000 that you get in direct support, your institution will get an additional 65, 70,000 from NIH in indirect support. And then that's designed to pay for the light, heat, the research office, all of the uh, kind of infrastructure that supports your research. Direct costs plus indirect costs are total costs. So be aware that that 249K is total costs. Your institution will take their chunk of indirect costs out of that. So you'll actually have about, depending on the indirect cost rate, 180,000 indirect costs to spend uh, on your research and your institute takes the balance. They'll be delighted to take the balance. And that also makes you a very attractive candidate when you're looking for positions because you come in with that you know, chunk of money that they're going to, they're going to collect uh, to, to run their operation. But we were, no, that's kind of the sticker shock thing. You're not going to get 249K. You're going to get 180K, roughly that. As we said in the last session, the success rates have been around 25%. Um, average over the, two th since 2007, when this award was first started, it's been 23.5 in 2020, it was 25%. And as John said earlier, notice that the number of awards has been increasing over time from around 200, 180 when it first started to now almost 300 and hopefully increasing beyond that. They vary, the number of awards vary by institute. Notice NCI, National Heart, Lung and Blood, are the big leaders in the number of awards that they support. But also notice that's very competitive. NCI is below the average, and Heart, Lung and Blood will be below the average. Some of these institutes, Institute of um, Alcohol and uh, alcohol, NIAAA is above, National Institute of Nursing Research is above. So if your proposal might fit within more than one institute, you know, be an educated consumer and, and shop around. The good news is that, this was done some years ago, that the average age of a K99 recipient is around 34, kind of early mid 30s. That means that they're hitting you know, put in a year or two for the K99 phase, they're hitting kind of their first independence, that R01, the R00 is kicking in around the mid 30s. So it's actually serving, meeting the goal for which it was established. And it is really one of the most attractive awards for young scientists that NIH offers. Uh, there's plenty of information. This website is the uh, NIH contacts page for the R. Uh, for this award uh, will enable you to identify who your program officer is and again contact your program officer because of the eligibility requirements it's particularly important to have those kinds of, of conversations about whether you can qualify for the award uh, there's an faq page at nih that will answer many of your questions plenty of resources there's also as i mentioned earlier a k-22 a career transition award has the same goals as the K99 R00. It's largely been superseded by the K99 R00, but is still used by a half dozen institutes for various reasons. 
it might be suggested to you if you're inquiring about a K99R00. So be aware of that award mechanism. I have nothing further to say. I'm gonna hand it over to John, who's gonna take you through the anatomy of an application. Let's check to see if there's anything in the chat. I don't think so. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand the uh, screen over to Dr. Lukowski. Great, can you see my screen? Yep, I can. Good. And just a comment on that transition from the K99 to the R002, two things. Um, the program officers for an institution are the folks that make the decision that you can move from into the R00 phase. So one of the unique advantages of this, you don't have to go and submit your grant to study section and go through this cycle, but it does mean you need to be communicating with your program officer so that they know um, you're giving them the information they need to, to approve it. And there have been no cost extensions on K99 sometimes, but for the most part, the track record of moving from a K99 to an R00 is very successful. And then my second point is, I've sat on study sections for R01s where uh, applicants who have R00s are submitting their first R01. Boy, oh boy, does study section get so excited because the community feels like hey, here's one of our trainees. They've had their R00, now they're moving to an R01. So there are so many benefits to this career transition award, but having an R00 already gives you a jump start on a successful R01. So keep that in mind too. Okay, we'll have time for a few more questions at the end. Um, Again, um, I hope you can tell Rob and I are big fans of this award mechanism. So the good news is that these K99R00 awards are much like other K awards. So the same application package, the same deadlines, and the same general review criteria. However, you have to emphasize clearly what are the unique features of this award. So that is you have a K99 for hopefully one or two years, and then the R00 phase. How does your application work for both of these and do they make sense? And the goal is for you to be prepared to successfully transition to an independent research program, your own program. And that's why this is known as a career transition award because that's a fundamental key issue. And I'll show you where that comes up in the application. Again, make sure you have the most current program announcement. Again, the parent announcement is fine. And you can look for specific institute specific awards. And many times those are for specific, specific niche the Institute is looking for. And remember, they come in three flavors, independent clinical trial not allowed for us basic scientists, independent clinical trial if you're doing a clinical trial, or basic experimental studies with humans. So that's if say you're doing a study on using human tissue. Again, the criteria are the same for the K99 as all the other K awards. You will get a score as the candidate, your career plan will get a score, your research strategy will get a score, your mentors and your environment. So what's important is you want to make sure as you prepare your application that you pay attention to each of these five areas because to get funded, you're going to need ones and twos from your reviewers to move your application into the funding range. 
Now, there's some slight differences on how these criteria are applied and for the K99 R00, and that's what I'll try to highlight for you with some suggestions. So as before for K award, the key review question is, is this candidate going to be ready in perhaps one or two years to become a successful independent investigator? So the reviewers are going to be looking at the candidate to say, you know, is this someone who's going to be able to successfully land a faculty position? Have they been publishing enough? And that's where the record of productivity is important. Have you as a candidate generated first author papers to show you can take on that role of being a principal investigator? Now, the, there's, the reviewers are supposed to comment, comment on the quality of your research training experience. That's a little subjective. What they will do is be enthusiastic about what you've been studying, and they're less concerned about where you train, but what you've been doing that gets you prepared to be independent. And it's really this last question. Will the candidate be able to achieve an independent tenure track like position within the two year period of the K99 phase? So I have seen really interesting K99 R00 applications not do well because the review panel felt the candidate needed more training and a K01 might be a better fit or a K08 might be a better fit or a K23. So this is the, the element of a K99 as you think about addressing that readiness. So how do you address these concerns? Absolutely, make sure your bio sketch is complete and highlights and shows your progress that you've made while you're a postdoc. Because typically, you're not going to write your K99 application the first year of post, your postdoc. It's kind of going to be in a sweet spot, maybe the end of year two, going into year three. And if you have a first author publication coming out, or it's been accepted, or it's been submitted, that can go on your bio sketch. This is actually the one time you can list app, uh, publications that are submitted. And also your mentor can discuss it too. Make sure in your candidate background section, you really focus on your commitment to a career in biomedical research. It doesn't mean you, you have to make a definitive statement that I wanna be a department chair when I grow up or I wanna to go to industry. It's that you are enamored of the field in which you work and you want to progress to leading an independent research program. And then this is where your K99 plan, training plan has to really relate to where you are, but show how during those one or two years, you're gonna learn something new. And then just like you're applying for a job, these reference letters have to speak to your readiness that with the K99 period, you will be ready to successfully make that leap and transition to being independent. So again, slightly different nuances, but these issues are vitally important. Now, your career development plan, the review questions are very similar to any K, K. Is this plan appropriate for your career stage and your career goals? And does the plan augment your current training? Are you going to learn something new? Such that the plan you have for that K99 phase will really substantially allow you to advance and be ready for a successful transition to independence. And this transition to independence is what drives 
the score for K99? And does the mentoring team have a plan to evaluate your progress during the K99 phase? Now, keep in mind, your mentors may or may not be available to you during the R0 phase, but during the K99 phase, those mentors have to be available and evaluate that you are meeting your milestones, that you're publishing, that you've learned your techniques, that you're beginning to do your job search and, and things are progressing. And this comes back to the timeline of what you plan. It's not a K award for five years, it's a K award for two years. So make sure your career development plan reflects what you're gonna do in the K, but go ahead and build the K99 to show them that you're thinking of, well, when I have my R00 phase, I'm gonna to have to hire a technician, recruit a graduate student. I'm going to have to submit an R01. You're not gonna submit the R01 as you start the R00 because you're likely collecting more data, but you want to make sure you build in time, maybe year two of the R00, which would be year five of four of the whole proposal, and that you're publishing. So again, all of this is looking at, the reviewers look at the entire package to see if the K99 and the R00 phase fit together in a way that will move you forward. So, at the end of the R00, you're ready for that R01 award. That's what the reviewers are thinking. Okay, it doesn't say in these criteria, will this person be ready for an R01? But that's what they mean by transition to the independent phase of the award. So how do you do this? Make sure you address this with your career development plan telling a story. Your prior experience, including what you've done already as a postdoc or if you're a clinician in your residency, and what you will accomplish in the K99 phase, and also what will you continue to accomplish in the R00 phase. So again, you have to make sure the reviewers can quickly understand what you're doing in your K99 phase. So put in a header that says K99 training phase, and then plans for the R00 phase, and put those in your summary table that's in your career development training plan and add grant writing and submission of an R01. So the reviewers understand that you've walked through all these different steps of your plan, okay? Now, make sure that you have something novel in the K99 phase. Again, NIH won't fund you to do what you've been doing for the last three years in your lab. You have to learn something new and that that novel approach really helps you own your, your question. And this is important because one of the challenges with the K99, because you're gonna branch off and be independent from your mentor and go set up your own research lab, you don't, you have to show that it's your question and not your research mentor's question because you, legally get to take all the reagents, the research idea, the data you've collected with you when you go to your R00 plan. And I'll tell you more about that. Now, include in your K99 phase that you're going to be ready for scientific independence because you've gained some professional development skills in managing others in grant writing and all sorts of scientific communication skills. But remember, you only have 24 months. So don't propose five years of work in that two month period. It has to be training that will really benefit you as you move on to be independent. 
So what we recommend as you develop your career development training plan, be sure to put in um, a table or a diagram that outlines what you're doing in the first two years, and then you transition to the R0, zero plan. And again, this is where you're going to have to meet with your mentors the first two years, just like any K, weekly with your primary mentor. If you have a co-mentor, maybe monthly, and then your mentoring team comes together and you have consultants and advisors. Some mentors volunteer to support you during the R00 phase. That's not a requirement. Uh, it only works if it's really genuine. And frankly, some of us who've been postdocs, by the time we go off to be independent, we want to be independent of our mentor. We want to publish without their name on our paper because that's how we show we're independent. Okay, the research plan absolutely is important because the reviewers are going to judge in your ability for your moving forward as a creative new thinker in the field. And so again, like we talked before, you need all the good elements of a research plan. Absolutely take advantage of your mentors and colleagues to give you feedback. And again, the research plan needs to be tailored to your career goals. Um, again, you'll have a one page for specific aims and you'll have uh, six to eight pages, depending on how many pages you use for the career development training plan. Um, and again, go for the three sections, even if innovation isn't required, absolutely put it in because your reviewers are trained to think this way. And if it's missing, they might forget that you're not, you're, you know, this is your first grant submission. So just, just put it in there, it's to your advantage. Now, what happens, and we're gonna talk about specific aims page uh, next Friday. This becomes a really key part of your grant proposal. And we will go through a way to communicate concisely in one page what you're going to do. But what I want to share with you, and this is from my recent experience of reviewing K99 awards, make sure when you get to your specific aims page that you make it clear the activities that you're doing under your different aims, what phase that aim will be done. So for example, this is just one uh, fake example. Aim one is going to be a K99 phase for some new in vitro studies. Aim two is gonna be some studies of the aging brain with a new genetics approach that you're going to learn. But notice sometimes it's a K99 slash R00 phase. So I will share with you, I've seen both of these. But by the time you get to the third aim, you should be showing what your study plan is for the R00 plan. By just putting these in parentheses and in bold, it helps the reviewer think through your proposal and it gives them a roadmap for both phases of your award. Now, again, notice AIM-1 and AIM-2 here weren't really in vivo studies. So if you do something like this, you have to make sure you already have the training in vivo studies that you learned prior to this K99. So don't propose something that's new, you want a new research study, but make sure you've gained all the skills you need to conduct AIM-3 from your prior training as a postdoc or a resident. And providing this roadmap helps you and your mentor delineate, hey, you know, I'm taking this with me when I head to Timbuktu in the United States 
and I have loved being a postdoc with you, but it's time for me to grow up and have my own lab. And that's actually one of the best parts of this K99 award because you, it forces you to have really important discussions with your mentor, your supervisor, who may be someone who's highly accomplished, has a big lab, but they have to commit to you successfully moving on to your R00 phase and not being in competition with you. And to me, that's worth a million dollars because I have seen bad blood between postdocs and their mentors. When a postdoc was working on a project before they had K99s, set up their own lab, and suddenly the mentor is competing with them. And you know what? Who's going to win? The mentor who has all the, you know, all the, the cloud and the reputation and a huge lab. And here's the little assistant professor starting their lab. The beauty of this award is this all gets worked out before you even start the project, okay? So how do you handle this? Here are the reviewer questions. Is the K99 research plan important, significant? And yeah, does it make sense? Is this a good plan to make sure you have the research skills to be successful with your R00 plan. So that relates to the science. And is the R00 phase scientifically sound and logical? This is important because the reviewers then have to comment, does this R00 have long-term viability translated Will this candidate be prepared to submit an R01 application and be a contributing member to our research community in this field of research? And again, is the R00 research likely to generate data and publications that will help this candidate obtain an R01 from the same institution, institute in NIH? So how do you answer these questions? Make sure your candidate statement describes your prior research prior to getting the K99. And then make sure the K99 research and the R00 research intersect. And keep in mind, you have to sort of show them, I need this K99 because I need a little more data. I need to learn a new technique. You know, I've never done an optogenetics and I want to use that in AIM-3, okay? The R00 phase, you have to pay attention to that research plan because that's where it's kind of like the K99 lets the R00 blossom. And so again, you're creative and you're keeping on with your productivity and your training. And here's where you're, you, you get your reviewers excited that you're going to become part of their research community. And then you need a description of how your research plan relates to your mentor and how you will achieve research independence. So you have to have a clear paragraph saying, I have developed this research and training, however, I'm going in a different direction for my research mentor. You have to kind of show you're going in a different branch. Sure, you may both be fundamentally interested in the aging brain, but your mentor has gone off the deep end with Alzheimer's disease, and you're going to look at a different neurodegenerative process from Alzheimer's. Make sure that's clear. And also, your mentors have questions that are a little different. They're going to look at your mentor's record of training. Also, not at just postdocs, but getting postdocs ready to transition to faculty positions. And how much and how are they supervising you during the K99? And are they evaluating you during the K99? Most of all, 
what are their plans for you to transition to an independent investigator? They must include one or two sentences that state you can take the intellectual ideas, the research concept, the reagents, the mice, the data, the antibodies, the whatever, when you move on. And this person, if they write a statement that they have no interest in pursuing the same research question, it can be a very strong statement. Okay, so keep that in mind. So again, how does a mentor do things? Make sure they document their qualifications, a co-mentor, and detail the plans for supervision for those two years, an evaluation of progress, and the plan for transition. Absolutely required. I have seen K99s come back from superb mentors, and they forgot to put in a clear statement that they would let the postdoc take the project to their own laboratory during the R00 phase. <clears throat> so they have to describe your plans, your supervising, and this plan for transition. And a good mentor will be very generous and say, hey, we'll help as they wish with uh, listening to their rehearsals of their job talks and chalk talks, things like that. Okay, institutional commitment, like any K, it's important because it shows that you have adequate time during the K99 phase. And it's committed to fostering your development and transition to the independent R00 phase. Why this statement is important is, you know, research involves intellectual property. And you might have a mentor who thinks, well, that's my intellectual property. And Joan can't take it when she goes to set up her lab over in Timbuktu because I want to keep it in my lab. This statement allows you to intellectually take all what you're doing to your new institution. Now, it is not saying that they're going to hire you for the R00 phase. This is only a commitment to you for those two years and to your transition. Now, if the dean or whoever writes the letter says, hey, we'd be happy to hire Rob when he finishes his R00 phase, that's fine, but that doesn't really matter. It's more important that the institution understands they have to help you successfully transition, okay? So this is important. So make sure you, you know, the letter has these details and a strong commitment to becoming independent. And this commitment typically is not dependent on you receiving the award. Now, this is a, a nuanced kind of thing because hopefully the institution is committed to you um, during your, your, your postdoc training or your residency research training. So that's what that's about. Again, it's one, one page and it commits to this, but it commits to that transition and the commitment to you for whatever percent effort you're doing the K99. Okay, I've been talking a lot. So let's open this up for questions. Rob, you wanna come back on and let's see, I'm gonna close my, stop sharing my screen, but all I can say is I can't figure out how to close it. Sorry guys, but these K99 awards are really a wonderful uh, vehicle and my little, thing has disappeared, so I'm sorry, folks. Oh, I found it. I'll stop sharing in a second. There we go. Okay. So Rob, any questions that we can help with? Yeah, there's a couple in the chat, um, and I encourage others because we have a few minutes left. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody's asking about, I mentioned the indirect costs and ask the location. It's not part of the indirect costs 
are not part of your application. That's automatically calculated by NIH. So when you receive, the, when the institution and you receive your notice of award, there'll be a number in there, dollar amount for direct costs, and that's what you have to spend. The institution on top of that will get their, their indirect costs at that, whatever the, the set percentage is. You okay. don't see that um, in some institutions, some of that funding is directed down to departments. It depends very much. Each institution has to um, justify how they're using that money and 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 where it goes to. But and Ron, that's you only with the R zero zero phase, not the K ninety, the K phase. Right, right. The no, the, the, the there's probably eight percent indirects on the on the K ninety nine, but only um but whatever is the uh mm -hmm. on on the r zero zero phase mm -hmm. you do receive it indirectly because that's the money that pays for the lights in your lab the staff in your research office mm -hmm. the library all of those kinds of institutional resources that support research right um is a quick one the k99 is for postdoc yes not phd students but there's a pilot that is called the F99, which is the transition from grad student into mm -hmm. postdoc. That's mm -hmm. being piloted by some institutions, particularly the uh, neuroscience-based institutes. At, at That's NIH. F99 K00. Right. Yep. And NCI does that, and I think they like it. And, and I've seen another institute come out recently on it. So. Uh, check it out if you're currently a graduate student and, um, you know, uh, take a look and keep an eye out for news about that. I know at West Virginia University, we have a, at least one, if not two, successful recipients. Good. Excellent. And mm -hmm. another question around if someone is in his last year of training fellowship, does he, she have to show that they will remain independent for the two year period? Well, um, you know, a clinician in the last year of a fellowship, I would think um, you're gonna need to show that if you receive this award, say you apply for one year of a K-99, um, you, you can't already move on to an assistant professor position. You probably have to extend your fellowship training a year. And I think they thought of this more less for fellows and specialties and more for residents because some residents are in five or six year long periods. And oftentimes they uh, receive protected time for research towards the end of a residency. That being said, I have colleagues who are doing fellowships, the four-year fellowship training, and the last year is 100% protected time for research. So that person would need to apply in year three of their fellowship in order to have that K99 during year four of their fellowship. So it depends on your situation, but you have to remain independent and then transition to your your faculty position in the R00 phase. But that's a great question for a program officer because NIH is trying to encourage clinician investigators or physician scientists, whatever term you use. So you may have a program officer who talks with you and says, you know, this would be great. And here's what I would suggest you do to be successful. Keep in mind, the program officer is never going to be reviewing your grant, but they sit into study sections and they listen and they understand how the criteria are being interpreted. So again, check it out. The worst case you can find out, you're not eligible. And maybe you're in year one of your fellowship and you can negotiate an independent year with your your department or your department chair for if you get this award. Now, there was a previous question that I responded to in the chat about um, 
-hmm. really about encouraging physician scientists, clinician scientists to apply. The NIH really loves those kinds of applications. Uh, there's another question about K grants for PhD students in biostats. Well, um, K grant, there wouldn't be a K for PhD students, but there would be a K99 would work well for somebody who's doing a postdoc in biostats. Or K25. And, and it might be a very nice model. So, mm -hmm. you know, your K99 phase would be maybe developing a new algorithm, a new statistical mm -hmm. method. And then the R00 would be applying it to a research problem in, in human biology, something like that. And um, keep in mind, a biostatistician could apply as a postdoc for a K25 award. Right. Which would give you more time if you needed to learn more on biology or maybe more genetics or more about clinical trial research. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that, but, you know, kind of, mixing things, taking what you've done before, learning something new, and then being the, the, the unique person to apply to, to, to address a really cool problem. That's, that captures a K-99. Okay. Our next um, question is about an applicant's track record in terms of number of publications, first author, middle author, and citations and all those kinds of things for a track record. You know, I would just say, first of all, if you're not publishing on a regular basis, at least one or two publications a year as a postdoc, reviewers kind of get nervous because how are you gonna show you're ready to be independent in the R00 phase? So they're gonna look at your, if you're already a postdoc and say you're in year three of your postdoc, they're going to want to see at least one paper generated. Now, there are some labs, uh, some big ones, large ones, they have what I call CNS disease, cell nature science. Those publications can take four or five years. And sure, it's very prestigious if as a postdoc, your first author in a nature paper. Frankly, Reviewers just want to see that you're publishing. Did you publish as a graduate student? Are you publishing as a postdoc? And again, it's there's no magic number. <laughs> and the journal citation, you know, the reviewers, if you're applying in a certain area, sort of understand the journals anyways. <laughs> so just make sure you're showing you're ready to be a senior author someday. I'm going to cough Rob so the questions yours. <laughs> Good, you gave me the tough one. Um, can you speak to the newly implemented NIH data management policy and how best to address that? Um, I, I would talk to your research office about that. Um, they are likely to have, you know, they, they can be very useful in kind of completing those required sections. Um, they ought, if they're doing their job, to have kind of boilerplate language that you can just drop into that section. You know, just like the uh, RCR um, component. You should be able to go to your graduate office or your postdoc office or your research office and say, you know, what do I put in that section? What do we do here? And right, and Rob, the new guidelines on data sharing go into effect January 25th, 2023. So this next year, I guarantee you'll see training offered by NIH. And NIH has, a, the last couple of years, in the summer and early fall, they have a virtual program you can attend. Uh, it may be in person this year. But there will be workshops on the new policy. So the data management, data sharing policy is something all our institutions are gonna to have to figure out. And in truth, I, I couldn't tell you today what to put into it. I can tell you what to put into your shared resources or um, you know, other parts, but data management is going to be a new area. And the reviewers are gonna to have to figure out this just, as, just like you are. Is okay. That, is that all the questions? 
I think so. Um, one of the comments I was going to make, and thank you guys, we're so glad you could attend. Uh, our interim director of NIH is Larry Tabak. He comes from the Institute of Dental Medicine. Uh, I've known him for a long time. He will be an advocate for this K99 award. So I encourage you as postdocs, as residents, as fellows, as faculty mentoring your, your trainees, really consider this award. It's a gem, and if you're really strongly interested in an academic career, as Rob indicated earlier, this helps you get your foot in the door for job interviews. Okay, Rob, as always, thank you for your help today. And I do want to acknowledge our support staff, uh, Sarah Heyman, who's manager of professional development, and Jody Saunders, who's manage a coordinator of professional development for the West Virginia Clinical Translational Science Institute. Hey, we're here. Uh, send us emails if we can help. And uh, again, we'll be meeting uh, next Thursday on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, for a program at 9 o'clock. And on the Friday the 18th, we'll have that interactive session on writing your specific games page. Sarah, any other closing remarks? Um, not necessarily. I know many people from yesterday inquired about slides and mm -hmm. recordings. Those will be disseminated um, after all sessions have been completed. Okay. And meanwhile, if you'd like a PDF, please make sure you complete the requested evaluation form when it comes your way. Dr. Milner, as always, thank you, and we'll see you next week. Take thank care, you. everyone. Take care. Have a good Bye. weekend.